excited to get um, started for our, our next panel on tackling these vexing educational problems and how to do that in some new, new ways, seeing through different perspectives. And our next group is going to be, whoops, sorry, I'm flashing ahead here. It's going to be looking at what is some, some people might say is one of the most intractable, in, intractable problems in education, really vexing issues around assessment and measurement and how are we going to ensure that we're, we're paying attention to what's happening, but we're not doing it in such a way that we're putting teachers in straitjackets and we're, we're providing like way too much information on something that doesn't matter. So I'm excited to introduce the moderator for this next panel, who is um, a, a colleague of mine here at New America, Elena Silva. She is the senior director for our pre-K-12 policy group in the education policy um, program here. And Elena's going to come up and introduce um, someone you've already seen, actually, who are excited to have join us for this conversation, along with our two guests who are online. Um, for those of you who are following this on the agenda, Sharon Wong from MDRC um, had a family emergency and um, unfortunately cannot be here. Um, so she sends her regrets, and I hope everything's going OK with Sharon today. But we're really um, thrilled to have Andrea also helping us with this conversation. So I'm going to turn it over now to you, Elena. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I want to start first. I'm Elena Silva. As, as Lisa just said, I work here at New America. I've worked here since I've worked here um, for the past eight years. I've worked closely with Lisa. I see she just exited stage left. But um, who has done a fantastic job, along with Elise and so many others, to build out LSX. I mean, I watched this evolve. And I just want to thank her and congratulate all of you for all of the great work. Um, so we are here, I am joined today um, on stage with, with one person who we've already met, Andrea Goldin. And um, Andrea is a professor and researcher, so I'm going to say this and you're going to correct me because there's more to it than this, but the National Scientific and Technical Research Council of Argentina, that's what I wrote down, um, but a neuroscientist, a biologist, and she has a lot of experience with assessment, with evaluation and measurement, and so we're just very glad that you can be here and, and help with this. Um, I'm also joined online um, by Andres Bustamante who is a professor of human development at the University of California, Irvine, and Tammy Kwan, who is the founder and CEO of Cognitive Toy Box, which is now part of Teaching Strategies. Um, we're going to dive in because, as Lisa said earlier, these are supposed to be um, fast, rapid fire um, sessions. So we have a lot to talk about and not a lot of time. We're going to dive in and learn more about your work and about what you have learned about creating next generation assessments. Um, before I ask a first question to Andrea, um, I want to mention that in 2011, I was part of the Gordon Commission on Assessment, on the future of assessment, I believe it was, um, which was sponsored or hosted by ETS. And it was a time when, in 2011, we were trying, we were, this idea of next generation assessments came up. We're like, well, let's make assessments better for the future. And I mention that because I'm very aware that it's not 20, 2011, and this has been almost 15 years now, and we're having this conversation at a time when I think it is the right time. So back then, we were having the right conversation, but I don't know if it was the right time for a lot of reasons. So I'm just I'm happy to be here to be um, hopefully shepherding this conversation so that we can talk about what assessment should look like. Um, if, if those of you, if anyone who's not familiar with Dr. Gordon, um, he, he has been a, a support and a mentor and just a, he's a wonderful human being. He's also a renowned psychologist. Um, and he led this commission um, with grace and with kindness and with discipline. And he also taught me, and I'll just begin with this, the difference between, in education, assessing learning, the assessment of learning, versus the assessment for learning. Because he believed, and, and still, still does, and speaks about very eloquently, um, that assessment for learning, assessment should be in service of learning. And we too often don't do that. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Anyway, we're going to dig into all of that. Um, let me start. Uh, Andrea, if you could tell us a little bit about your work and about your uh, opinions and perceptions about the role of assessment in education and learning. I, I think uh, you, you previously mentioned some uh, one key point. Um, because, well, I'm a researcher. And actually, uh, so what do we 
assess for, and we we, we evaluate to know if to know if something worked. And in research, and that is, uh, I think that is quite perfect to do it. It's very straightforward, and the limitations are clear. And we tried we do an experiment or an intervention or a study, and we need to know if it worked. So we go and we assess that, and we understand that uh, every person is different, uh, but we want to capture the cognitive processes that all humans of, from a population share. And so to, to use one assessment for all is pretty much correct in, in that dimension. But uh, when we think uh, f uh, about assessments at schools or in the classroom, that's quite different because we also want to use them because we need to understand if uh, if the students understood and and most importantly if they can apply what they learned, uh, if they can apply it correctly. Uh, but we have like I don't know 30 persons, 20 persons in in one room, and we need to have that measurement. So at the end, it, there, there is this problem that it standardizes everybody. Uh, so, and, and so we, we end up not knowing actually if something works for, for everybody or not, or for most of them or not. Um, because uh, the, 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 I mean, we end, uh, we end up measuring the, the final product. The, so did you, could you understand this? C can you apply this? But we forget that learning is a very complex and uh, back and forth cognitive process that takes a lot of time and takes a lot of uh, everything. <laughs> and so it's not that if you made the test, if you passed the test, you learned something, and if you didn't, don't pass the test, you didn't learn that. So I think that the, the main problem is that, uh, is that that difference between standardization or individualized, the, 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 um, the individualized process. So. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and I love that, that that tension comes up a lot in education, in assessment, not just in assessment, the tension between standardization and personalization or individualization, and we're trying really for different reasons to do both all the time in school systems. Um, I'm going to turn Tammy to you, um, who, and I, I want to mention that if those, those of you who weren't here this morning, uh, Andrea is an LSX fellow, so is Tammy, so I just want to acknowledge that, um, a former LSX <laughs> fellow. <laughs> Tammy's getting all the applause. Um, you developed a direct game-based assessment platform for young children. Um, can you tell us how you came up with this idea and how it works and how it might improve the experience of assessment for educators and for students? Yeah, of course. And uh, thank you for having me here. I founded Cognitive Toy Box nine years ago, and it was spun out of my graduate school work with New York City Head Start and Pre-K programs, where I'm still based today. And at the time I was in the classroom and I saw firsthand the challenge was around early childhood assessment where teachers were doing a lot of pencil paper assessment. It was taking a lot of time for teachers and it wasn't the most actionable. And so where I found an opportunity to potentially innovate was in terms of developing direct student assessments for three to four year olds. And at the time, iPads were just starting to come out, they were starting to be used, and I had this aha moment in terms of what if we were to develop game-based assessments on the iPad for three and four-year-olds. I think today that isn't really a radical idea, but nine years ago when I first suggested that, I think folks thought I was crazy. Uh, and, um, and it really took four years of really inner dis uh, cross sector partnership with researchers in order to establish that basic research that game-based assessments on touchscreen devices could, in order to prove that it could be a developmentally appropriate, accurate, and actionable way of assessing child development for children three to five years of age that this approach finally started to take off. And really excited to um, see what else we can continue to do to uh, strengthen on that. Thank you, Tammy. Um, I, I'm going to turn in a minute to, to you, Andres. Um, I do want to say that uh, just 
on a cross-sector collaboration and the importance of it. Um, and I know that, Andres, you can speak to this too around the, the parents and the students, the children that you've worked with, um, that when I was working with assessment long ago, so even like 20 years ago or so, the question was when you were trying to figure out assessment for whatever grade level or whatever subject, it was, well, you should find the psychometrician who will help you figure that out. And that meant you were going to a researcher, and I did a lot of research myself, so I was like, oh, that seems right, I'll go to the researcher and find, and that was it, that really was the conversation. And then the, then the tests were created, and the tests, and we're talking about mostly summative, it is the teachers that are often creating the formative assessments, but those, those tests were then just sort of planted in places. So this idea that you're creating it with people who are the users and, and who, are, who represent just different sectors to be able to come up with a product that actually could be more dynamic and meaningful and perhaps a next generation assessment um, is profound and important for us to consider. So, so Andreas, you've had a lot of um, experience working um, in schools and with parents and with children and educators. Um, you worked with parents and educators specifically to design fraction balls. So for those of you who can, who online might be able to look at the online bulletin board, you'll see a picture um, there. I believe, it's, I believe it's a graphic that you'll be able to see there. Um, fraction ball is amazing. I just learned about it when I was talking with Andres earlier, and now I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with fraction ball. Um, but so it's a play-based, hands-on math game that repurposes an actual basketball court. So that's how it works. Um, can you tell us about it, Andres, tell us more about it, and how it can perhaps bridge this gap between more traditional academic testing measures and what's actually, and actually how children learn? Yeah, absolutely, and thanks so much again for inviting me. I'm uh, super honored to uh, get to connect with this uh, amazing community. So yeah, Fraction Ball is a redesign of the basketball court for kids to learn rational numbers, fractions and decimals. And we know that fractions and decimals are super hard. They're like a huge barrier and milestone in kids' math development and a place where they start saying stuff like, I'm not a math person, math is not for me. And it's because they change many of the rules about fraction, about, about math. So up until fractions, a bigger number means more. This is consistent more magnitude. But in fractions, a bigger denominator means a smaller piece, right? Because we're dividing. And so uh, many times the way that kids learn fractions is very procedural. They're memorizing steps, but they're not learning like on a more conceptual level, like what is a fraction? It's a whole broken into equal parts and the denominator tells you how many parts. And so our design of the basketball court, we make the traditional three point arc into a one whole point line. And then we have smaller arcs close to the basket worth a quarter point, a half a point, three quarters of a point. The left side of the court is decimal representations and the right side is fractions. So kids can see 0.75 and three quarters are the same magnitude. Just Yeah, so there's a number line on the side of the court for them to keep track of their score, of their points. Um, so this builds on lots of research on math cognition and um, embodiment and, and play and joy and learning. I saw one of my mentors, Roberta Golenkoff, in the crowd. And so, you know, drawing heavily from what I've, I've learned from her on, on play uh, and playful learning. And so um, I think what's special about Fraction Ball is it's an opportunity for kids to get outside and move their whole body and learn math in the context of play. And so for me, where it connects to the measurement perspective is, is if what we think is special about Fraction Ball is this playful, full body experience. And then if the way that we measure it is just simply giving a math test, you know, one third plus two thirds, what does that equal? Um, we're kind of missing out on some of the, the magic and, and the context of what makes Fraction Ball special. And so one thing that we've done in that project is we created a video game version of Fraction Ball. Um, and then we give kids scenarios and situations so that they can apply the math uh, a learning in the context of play and playful situations and also engage their executive function skills like um, their working memory or their inhibition or their cognitive flexibility. And so by providing a gamified assessment to be the, uh, the outcome or the, of this uh, gamified experience, um, we feel like uh, we're, we're staying more true to the, the nature of the intervention. And also we're picking up on important skills that kids are um, learning and developing during Fraction Ball that maybe they wouldn't if we just drilled them on a bunch of fraction arithmetic problems, right? It's because um, it, there's this tension that we want kids to learn all types of things 
including how to collaborate with others, how to be creative and critical thinkers. And the way that we, the way that we assess them is very narrow and it's very focused on the easy, easily measurable rote skills. And so it's, it sets up a, a sort of um, a discontinuity between how the learning environment is designed and how we're assessing. And so I think to the extent that we can, um, our solution as a field has been to make the learning environment more like the assessment, but I think it's, it's a powerful idea of how can we make the assessment more aligned with what we want the learning environment really to be. And that's what we're really trying to um, do in this, in this work. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to playing fraction ball at some point, or at least seeing it in all, on all the basketball courts, because it looks like it can be there and also, well, anyway, that's a longer story about fraction ball. Um, I, one thing I wanted to acknowledge is, is that there's a, a through line here from even from the morning and the, when, when we were showcasing all the games, the bingo and the, the bo mystery box and all the things, um, there are games. There's just games everywhere, you know? And, um, we have games even here at New America, like we, and we do it in part because we know that you need to stop, you need to change, you need to move, you need to use your brain differently, and manipulatives can help, and there are all these different ways that games can help us um, learn and grow and think and develop. Um, so we're recognizing that in all of our work, and now here we are talking about assessment, which is usually when people are like, also after lunch, I mean, thanks, Lisa, like assessment. Um, um, it sounds really dry, you know, and here we are talking about actually with three people, three experts who all have experience with game-based assessment. Is that, That's right, right? Yes. And so there's something, we've heard the term before, game-based assessment, but there's something about this game-based um, that really is, is quite profound. So I just want to acknowledge that. I'm going to ask uh, um, Tammy, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the time. Um, and then I'll ask one more question of the, these folks, and then if you have questions in the audience, um, I'm ready for you. So, Tammy, what can K-12 assessment policy, because this is, well, what can K-12 assessment policy learn from these whole child, and I'm going to add game-based, assessment practices in the early childhood settings? Yeah, I think the wonderful thing about being in early childhood is that it is play-based, and educators recognize that play-based learning is the best way to do learning with early childhood. I think that K-12 assessment players would benefit from taking a more play-based approach in terms of K-3 to assessment in particular. Much of K-3 to assessment is the upper elementary scale down. And the difference between K-12 to assessment and early childhood is it, there's almost like an artificial divide where K-12 to is very academic. It's almost hyper too um, overly myopic in terms of focusing just on literacy and sometimes on math. Versus if you look at early childhood, it's whole child. It's play-based. The assessments are very, very flexible in terms of being largely observational. K-12 is largely direct. It's, um, it, it's focused on literacy and math. I believe, especially in the K-3 to ecosystem, there's a possibility of scaling up the early childhood assessment approach to make it more developmentally appropriate for children K-3 to uh, years of age in order to make it more whole child focused and, and in order to make it more play-based. Yeah, we were talking, Andrea and I, just before this, about um, our respective uh, starting primary school, and then I have a son who's in college, and so my son hated school. Like, from the day he walked in, he's, I love learning, I hate this place. I don't like the structure, I don't like the rules, he didn't like it. Um, and what, and over the years, when you take the first back-to-school picture, you know, it starts out like, and then slowly every year, <laughs> till high school when he was like, I'm not even taking the picture anymore because I hate school so much. But now he's thriving and uh, thriving because now he's outside of our K-12 system in a place where he has freedom and he can do his own thing. And he's still, he's learning how to learn outside of this box that we really have for a lot of reasons created. Um, so just to acknowledge that, that the games, there should be games. And so it's not, it's K-3, but also in high schools. In high schools is where, we, you know, these adolescents, like we really need to help them have some, some fun that, well, anyway. Um, okay, a last question and then I'm gonna go, I see you, Katie, I'm gonna go to, to the um, audience. Um, for Andres and, and Andrea, um, actually all of you, really, what, um, how should we think about assessments and the challenges of creating assessments 
for the developmental variability of children. Like not all children are the same. We have a lot of children with learning disabilities, multilingual learners, a lot of different types of children. And, and we're trying to create assessments as it goes back to the standardization issue. Um, how do we create next gen assessments that are meeting the, the needs of those children? Uh, I can tell you uh, uh, an anecdote that happened to us a few years ago at the school. We were uh, working with the first graders and we were assessing, we were using uh, a fluid intelligence test that basically you have one picture and you have to choose which of many options uh, fit better, which are related. And so there is just one correct option. And uh, these six-year-olds were uh, from a low socioeconomic background, but otherwise typically developing children. Um, and we, when we analyzed the data, we realized that many of the children, well, usually low SES, uh, low socioeconomic status uh, children, um, score uh, less than, than what would be expected for their age. And when we analyzed the data, we realized that they were scoring less, but the, the options they chose were not randomly chosen. When we saw just one trial, we saw that many of them chose the correct answer, but many of them chose another, another answer, all, but all of them the same. So we went to see what were those trials looking like. And for instance, you have the target option that was a, a, um, a milk, that was a carton of milk, a gallon of milk. And on the options, you have a glass, which was the correct option. But you, you also have a desk. And many of the poor children chose the desk. And so we started to ask them, why are you choosing this? Because we have milk at school. So, so, and we have another one, it's and pretty much the same. Uh, the target was a train, and what the correct option was a, a train track. But many of the poor children chose coins, and we went and asked them, why are you choosing coins? Because to get into a train, you have to count the coins. So, uh, so they were um, missing the points on that test that was meant to measure uh, reason, reasoning. And they were reasoning pretty perfectly. So, so I think uh, uh, it's, imp it's uh, essential to understand, uh, to, to develop uh, tests uh, uh, by people that know the population that, that are going to take those tests. Appreciate that. Andres, I want to give you a chance to, to respond, and then I'm going to open it up for, for questions. Yeah, just really quickly, I mean, one thing that sticks out to me about measurement in general is like thinking really critically about like, what do we actually want to measure? So if our goal is to assess a kid's language ability, and we only allow that child to um, answer questions in English, we're not measuring their language ability, we're measuring their English ability, right? And so if we think about multilingual learners or dual language learners, um, uh, if you're only allowing them to use part of their linguistic repertoire, um, you're actually not getting a strong measure of their, of their language ability, right? You're just getting one piece of it. And I think it's so critical to be thinking about capturing the strengths and the assets of the children that we're trying to assess, particularly when they come from um, marginalized um, communities. Um, and so, uh, like, we know from, from lots and lots of research that multilingual learners, if you combine their whole linguistic repertoire, they have really strong language skills, right? And we know that those language skills, even in, in two languages, long-term will predict better uh, English language skills. Um, because again, they have this, this strong language foundation. And so um, I think those two things, being really mindful of, of the strengths of, of, the, of the folks that we're trying to measure, the kids that we're measuring, and then also being really thoughtful about what do we actually wanna know and is our, are our measurement paradigms and approaches giving us the information that, that we wanna have. And so something like using conceptual scoring, so counting, uh, all di dialect and language and all different, giving kids credit for the things that they know, um, even if they don't conform or adhere to what you expected an an a correct answer to look like. That's great, thank you. Um, I think we have time for a question. Uh, let's go audience first. 
They're, they're dueling. <laughs> I'll let you choose. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you. This is a wonderful panel. And um, I've followed all of your work for so long. And I'm just so excited to see it come to fruition. Um, but I did want to say, really, a comment, two things. One is that I think the way you're talking about assessment also does what Andy just talked about, which is to find multiple inroads to find out what people know. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, presentations. There are a lot of um, well-worn rules and regulations in schools in the United States and across the world mandating standardized assessments. Um, how do you begin to move that pendulum over to uh, an environment where the formative assessments are either as equally recognized as summative or, quite frankly, really just formative. I have thoughts, but I'm going to defer to my panel. Um, I'll, I'll chime in quickly. I think it has to do with um, leadership in this uh, specific example. So um, teachers many times are um, bound to adhere to these, you know, very rote summative assessments. And I think it takes visionary school leadership from principals and superintendents to kind of release those pressures and allow their, their educators to innovate and to do the things that we know, create great educational spaces. And so I can think of several examples um, of, of district leaders making these kind of uh, uh, commitments and really uh, providing an example that um, we don't have to be bound by by um, these these uh, very rigid standardized tests. I'm thinking about some colleagues in Anaheim uh, Union uh, School District uh, it, here in California. Uh, and this is a high school district where the, the superintendent basically said, um, we're not gonna keep doing the same thing. We've been doing it for 30 years and we're getting nowhere. And so instead of um, using the, the standardized assessments, they are doing a project with my colleague June on where they're um, having the kids do project-based learning and make portfolios. And then they're using AI to code those, those projects and the kids describing the projects for 21st century skills communication, collaboration, critical thinking, uh, creativity. And so it's not just, an, I just love what Tammy shared earlier that um, early childhood has a lot of things right and the rest of um, K-12 and beyond uh, could learn a lot. But I think it takes a brave leadership uh, and folks will, being willing to say, um, I'm gonna kind of put myself out there and, and pave the way for my teachers to do the excellent work that, that they really wanna be doing. Mm -hmm. I would love to add uh, to that that um, teachers uh, should have more time and should have more paid time uh, to do that kind of assessments uh, because to to do more personalized and individualized uh, education needs time and needs mind on that and teachers I think are also like the best to do that but they need to be able to do it. Uh, we could go on and on about this. Um, I want to thank my panelists. Thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciate you being here. Hand it over to you.